You only have yourselves to blame. I did not expect you all to be feral for the murder board video. Hello friends, my name is Ash, and on this channel we talk about the fun of costuming and live action roleplay, which carries over surprisingly well into the sphere of tabletop roleplaying games. If you put on a costume and turn your camera on, you're like halfway to LARP. But if you too are far more used to roleplaying at a table, or more likely at a desk, this video is seven ways of being more immersed in your game, from someone with 23 years of combined roleplay experience. Yes. I know, none of you can tell how old I am, just trust me. I've been playing D&D since 3rd edition came out in 2000. Number 1. Prepare thyself. You are not always going to be in the best place mentally or physically to roleplay. Maybe you've had a tough week at work or school, or you're tired, or hungry, or sad, or sick, or any one of a million other reasons. But even if you think you're on top form, taking 5 or 10 minutes to prepare for the game before you stick your headphones on or come to the table can help a lot with your experience. A lot of this is basic self-care stuff. Are you comfortable? Is your desk clean and tidy? Do you have drinks or medicine or a blanket to hand around where you're going to be playing? Have you eaten? Have you been to the bathroom? Do you have snacks or activities? Literally treat yourself like a toddler about to go on a road trip. But also take a couple of minutes to just prepare yourself mentally for what's about to be several hours of feeling someone else's emotions and making tough decisions in what is inevitably going to be a high stakes environment. You don't want to take an hour or two just to get into the game and you don't want to be carrying your own baggage into that space for no other reason than this is supposed to be fun. You don't want to stress your way through your fun time, right? How you're going to do this is kind of up to you and it might always be the same or it might differ from session to session or character to character. But I really like doing things that require me to focus my full attention on one single thing for a few minutes. It's like hitting the reset button on your brain. Maybe you do a two minute or five minute guided meditation. Maybe you just take 10 deep counted breaths. Maybe you listen to a song, either the same song every time or you choose a song that fits the vibe for where your character is right now. And either sit there and really feel the words and the music or sing along or if like me you have ants in your brain, dance to it. A lot of this kind of I find focuses really heavily on sitting still and being able to clear your mind, but I actually find physical movement really great for sweeping out all the dust and stress and worries from the day. Dance, stretch, do a five minute workout, whatever gets the good chemicals going, even if it's like a 15 second plank. But what, I hear you cry, what if I'm late for session? As a GM and as a fellow player, I would rather you arrive 15 minutes late but alert, engaged and ready to kick ass and take names than 5 minutes late and were fuzzy, distracted and temperamental all session. You don't need to justify or describe your pre-game ritual. You were just running late and had to get everything sorted before you could play. Plus it's tabletop, chances are you're not the only person behind schedule. I am fully aware that if you are a GM, your pre-game ritual is probably whispering I had all week to prep, why am I like this, over and over as you upload icons and rescale maps and roll out NPCs just in case, but try and take 5 minutes for you, okay? You deserve of it. Number two, put the character in a box. For a lot of my LARP characters, at least while they were in play, I had a box where I could keep all of the stuff that was specific to them. So I'd have game ephemera like the spell and item cards and letters and a notebook usually and key pieces of jewellery or special objects, a particular deck of cards, a special pen, some item that represented an in-game resource or mechanic and so on. This served two great functions. Firstly, if I needed to play that character, everything I really, really needed was in that box. I could in theory grab just the box and go to the event and I was going to be okay-ish. Secondly, when the event was over, I could put all this stuff back in the box and then close it and put it away. This tip actually breaks down into I think three sub tips not including the main point which is put your character sheet and your game notebook and your dice and your rule book and whatever else in the same place and keep them together. You know you're going to need all of these things to play, have them in the same place, sew a pouch for them, pick a drawer in your desk where they will live, put them in a box, one place all together so you're not going crap where's my character sheet, crap I need dice, 10 minutes into the game. You know I'm right. Number three, ambience. So my Mama O'Brien went into much more detail than I'm going to in her video on immersive tabletop role playing experiences, link here. So I'm going to try not to replicate too much of that and instead expand upon it by offering some other ways you can enhance the ambience of your desktop setup when playing a role playing game and maybe some other suggestions for things to put in your character box. Taste. Oftentimes I am role playing starting at about dinner time so I'm often brought to dinner in the first 30 minutes to an hour of the game so food is deeply variable for me, usually I haven't picked it, I may be snacking the whole time, I may not snack at all but what I always do have is a drink to hand because in a hobby that is 90% talking you will need a drink to hand. LARPers. 
Role players, I love you all dearly, but you are dehydrated as hell. Please drink something. Why are you surprised when you have a sore throat at the end of the weekend? So I like to seek out an appropriate drink for my character, at least to start off the session with. Now this can be tricky. My current most established tabletop character prefers to drink two things, sweet black coffee, which I'm not touching at 10 p.m. and cocktails, which I cannot have as I don't drink alcohol. But what he also has a lot is soda, which I very rarely drink. So it's a little treat and it's a nice bit of character ambience to pick out a limited edition flavor of Japanese Fanta for a Saturday night. Now, in case it wasn't obvious, that is a modern day game. But I think if you're into fantasy, there's a lot of mileage to be had with flavored and fruit teas, which remember you can always cold brew by just putting them in cold water or some other liquid in your fridge all day or overnight, as well as brewing hot and water or milk or flavored syrups that you can put in coffee, hot or cold milk, lemonade, alcoholic drinks, sight. So this is my murder board. <laughs> I've got a whole video about it, and yes, this takes up an entire wall of my workroom. Look, I've been playing the same character almost weekly since July 2020. I have a lot of feelings. And I got given a lot of handouts that only exist in a Discord channel or maybe a PDF, so I forget they exist. So I print them out. I'm not a big note taker. I am in fact that weirdo who can't remember NPC names or place names and locations or what loot we found if I didn't specifically pick it up. But we'll turn around and say, hey, like two years ago in this specific other location, we were searching for clues and I found this thing that was about this thing that we're investigating now. And I'm pretty sure it linked into, oh no, wait, I found it by searching in Discord for the exact phrase I remembered perfectly. Yeah, I think we can fill in some of these gaps. But having them as physical objects that exist in my space and feel vaguely in character for where we found them, it definitely gets me from A to B much quicker. And I very much enjoy the process of horribly distressing pieces of paper to reflect the fact that we found them in a creepy abandoned high school or a vampire's lair or the underworld. Before any of my fellow players call me out, yes, I am behind on updating the murder board, okay? I've been very stressed. Here, I could use this space to extol the virtues of the character playlist, but honestly, I think that's very much an out of session thing rather than a while we're playing thing. So a lot of people play music during their session, which is great. And in the wake of the demise of basically all Discord player bots, there's a bunch of workarounds, none of which are great, but we get by. But uh, yeah, about 50% of the time I have the music turned off. It's awesome when I can listen to it, really atmospheric, but quite often I have issues processing multiple sources of noise. And if it's important that I hear and pay attention to the voices, sometimes I can't have the ambient soundscape or I will be inexplicably confused, distracted, or angry. So with hearing, what I actually want to talk about is not additive, it's subtractive, which is get rid of all the sounds that are not good sounds. This can be dialing down on the background noise of your environment, whether it's your computer tower fan wearing like a search and rescue helicopter, or long-time guest star on the channel, the cuckoo clock in my living room. Close the door of the room you're playing in. Be aware of where your pets are. Put your phone on silent. Consider noise cancelling headphones if that's in your budget. It can also be trying to only share the good sounds, i.e. your voice, and muting yourself if you're typing or doing a noisy activity for an extended period of time. This is honestly always kind of a losing battle. You're never going to win. There's always going to be distracting noises you can't do anything about. But I feel like people who don't continually exist in the realm of do I hate everything or is an old electronic device on standby emitting a noise only dogs and I can hear really underestimate how much of a difference cutting down on their background noise can make on their experience. Also muting to eat is appreciated but seriously your microphone is not that good. Nobody can hear you chew. Smell. Smell is perhaps the sense that has the most direct route to our lizard hind brain so it's sure exciting that mine is bad. Scented candles are great but they are the scent equivalent of carpet bombing a space. My partner unlike me is very sensitive to airborne volatiles, so any candle exciting enough that I can actually smell it is migraine inducing for him. And also you might not be able to burn candles in the place that you live, so here are some alternatives. Lavender or herb sachets. You can just have these near you or sniff them directly if you need a hit. You can also pack one into your character box or with some clothing or a blanket that you like to use when you roleplay, so you get a very subtle scent whenever you interact with that stuff. Essential oil preparations or perfumes. These apply directly to your body, so they can also ambiently scent just you, or you can again just sniff the bottle when you want to. I have these aromatherapy rollerballs which have different moods. I think that's a really cool alternative to having a character or environment specific perfume. So instead have something that's like be energized, relax. Room sprays, still very in your face, but if the potency of the airborne particles isn't an issue, it's just the fire that's a problem. Great shout. I have a bunch of Black Phoenix Alchemy Labs room sprays that I think I've had literally for more than 10 years because the last time I ordered from BPAL was in university or something. Uh, they're still going strong, provided the quality hasn't dropped 
watch recently, I think I can probably recommend them. And if you play near a radiator or a device like a rapidly aging computer tower that kicks out a lot of heat, you can put a uh, wax melts in a little dish, ideally metal. Ceramic's also probably okay, doesn't conduct heat as well. And now you have a really rubbish flame-free wax melter. This is the last one on the list because it is not good, but it does just about work. Number four, fizz reps. You'll notice I missed out touch from that lineup and that's because it gets its own category. I am a LARPer. You know what LARPers love? Fizz reps. Physical representations are exactly that. It's a physical object that represents an in-game object. Sometimes it represents an object extremely accurately. The letter is a letter. Sometimes it's a step away. The potion bottle is a potion bottle, but please don't crack it open and drink it. It's white spirit and mica powder. And sometimes it's very abstract, like this pom-pom is a fireball. Have a think about what things your character has, either objects or abilities, would be better if you had a physical object in front of you when you play. I've talked about my handouts already. A lot of people go in for miniatures, which great, love that for you. Personally, I do not need another hobby, oh god. Although for a past character, I wanted to get a toy horse to represent their war horse that they stole, so that I would remember that I needed to take care of him, and etc. I ended up not being able to find what that I liked at the time, but I still sort of fancy having a horse statuette. The horse's name was Horse. I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you can find a representation for some very important jewellery that your character has, or a significant heirloom, or something that represents a magical item. And then you've got something tactile there on your desk to touch and fiddle with. Maybe you have some kind of finite resource like spell scrolls, or potions, or ammunition, and you need to keep track from session to session how many you have, and you're always adding and subtracting from that number, and well, why not make little model scrolls or potions or bullets? Or you could use some kind of token or counter that already exists, I'm just extra, and then you can stack them on the desk and put them back in the big bag when you use them, take them back out of the bag when you make more. Why check off hit points on a piece of paper when you can gradually take tokens away from your pile and slowly watch your remaining health get smaller and smaller? and smaller. If anyone can figure out how to do that with the World of Darkness damage tracking rules, please let me know. Bashing lethal and aggravated are ruining my life. Number five, de-rolling. And finally, the most important part of putting the character in a box is, I think, at the end of the session, putting the character back in the box, closing the lid and putting them away until next session. For some people in some sessions, that's really easy. You don't even think about it. Sometimes I just need a little wind down activity. At one point, coincidentally, new Morgan Donna videos were showing up around the time we finished tabletop and watching one of those with a cup of tea was just the perfect unwind at whatever small hour of the morning. But for some people and some sessions, not so much. One of the tricky things about being really immersed is that at some point you have to unimmerse yourself. You need to be able to be fully present in your own life, not be half in a fictional world all the time. Being able to put emotional distance between you and your character is a very necessary skill and it's a difficult one and I think we don't talk about it enough. A lot of people extol the virtues of being really immersed in the game and then after just just seem to ride it out and wait for the character to fade into the background again, however long it takes. Or don't, and we'll literally bring up in-character stuff every time you speak to them. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's all just a bit too good, and you want to wallow for a little bit. That's okay. But if your character is impacting your ability to enjoy your life, then that is also impacting your ability to enjoy being your character. It's escapism. You cannot be escaping literally all of the time, or nothing matters. Now the Nordic players in the audience are probably jumping up and down and waving frantically, and I know, I know, there are loads of, loads of great resources out there in the LARPosphere about de-rolling and debriefing workshops, and maybe those are great resources for you, dear viewer, but I am incredibly neurospicy, and the sheer concept of honestly evaluating my own experiences in a group setting is so alien. Like, obviously I'm just going to lie. Even if I've processed enough by that point to say something genuine, I'm gonna pick something socially acceptable instead, and if I don't, I'm gonna cringe about it for months afterwards. Nobody needs to hear my unfiltered thoughts. Yes, this is a me problem, but it's not a uniquely me problem. So group debriefs are great if they work for you, but I think we need to build some individual de-rolling skill sets too, especially if you're doing this at home, distanced from all your other players. There's almost certainly as many ways of going about this as there are people playing tabletop, but if you're struggling to put the character back in the box, here's how I do it. First, ask yourself, what am I feeling? A lot of the time we have a whole bunch of emotions and it can take a bit of unpicking to go, oh, actually, I'm not worried about what's going to happen next, I'm angry about being put in this situation in the first place. Or I'm not just really upset about this plot point, I feel threatened. Or even, I'm actually not enjoying this game right now. I'm just putting on a good face for everybody else. Take your time in whatever way works best for you. Maybe writing them down, maybe talking to someone you love, to really articulate what these feelings are, not just that you're upset or worried or, dunno, bad vibes. Second, 
why am I feeling that? What's the actual root cause? And there's two possible answers for that. One is something that has actually happened. Another player screwed over your character in a way that wasn't fun and puts you in a really difficult spot. And you're angry that you're going to maybe lose a character because someone else was selfish. This plot point was something you said you were uncomfortable with and everyone has pressed on with it regardless. It feels like every character except you has had some personal plot, specifically Taylor's story arc, and you're kind of bored because you're not really that involved in the game. The other possible answer is it's in your head which is still important and can massively affect you, but it's really important to be able to acknowledge when things that are really affecting you are not because of something anyone else immediately did, and thus nobody else but you can fix them. Your character is in a high-risk situation for completely normal tabletop RPG reasons, and you're just really struggling with the idea of losing them. This plot point accidentally hits some of the same emotional beats as something that actually happened to you, and maybe no one else at the table knows about. You're spending all of your time worrying about what the other players might do or think about you, or that you're hogging too much of the spotlight so you can't get properly involved in the game. Sometimes getting through questions one and two is enough. Being able to identify what you're feeling and why is enough to go, oh that's silly, and put it away, maybe just like that, maybe in the not today Satan way like you do with a reoccurring intrusive thought. Most of the time you need to then share your findings in order to do anything about it. We're going to talk about communication in a bit, but to be clear, introspection then communication. That's productive. I'm having a tough time with this for these reasons, I don't think there's anything you can do about it, I just want to make you all aware, is a perfectly legitimate thing to bring to the table, especially when you're playing with your friends and they might have advice or encouragement. I'm mad at you for getting my character killed is kind of a non-starter, like what is anyone supposed to do with that? Potentially, if they're not very emotionally mature, make out like this is a you problem. I'm angry you put me in this position without checking in, I feel like you threw me under the bus for your own gain, that's not the kind of game I enjoy and I would like it if we all talked about what our expectations for PvP in this game are. Brutal, elegant, hard to argue with, you just brought a gun to a knife fight. And then sometimes, you just need some time to yourself to feel this feeling a lot. I feel like I've talked mostly about negative feelings here because those are actually the easy ones. They're big and ugly and things that you notice that you're struggling with, but the kinds of feelings you carry out of role-playing games can be all over the place and sometimes the best way to deal with them, even the positive ones, is instead of carrying them until the next session, just let it all out. One time, a tabletop session I was in hit a very specific emotional beat, focused on my character, that was, well looking back at the start of what would be a extremely cathartic and healing arc for the character and for me as a player because I'm a fool and continue give my characters my own emotional baggage, and I think I could see the start of that arc, but it could have gone a bunch of different ways, some of which would have been devastating. And in that moment it was just a lot, and I couldn't sleep. The what if, what if, what if was just going around and around in my head, and I really try not to imagine how I think scenes that haven't happened yet are going to go, because it always sets you up for disappointment, and I was struggling. So when the sun came up, which it did pretty quickly, depths of lockdown, we used to play until like 2, 3 in the morning, I got up, I got dressed, and this character, he's a pop star, He's where I currently put my ongoing hyperfixation with music. The way he would deal with this situation is by sticking his headphones in and blasting something extremely appropriate. And I as a player like things to get out of my head through physical activity. This character, he was scared and lost and conflicted and isolated and had potentially just completely ruined his relationship with the only legitimate parental figure he had, and he had no idea if this could be repaired or healed, or if that was even what he wanted. And so at the crack of dawn I took a brisk two and a half hour walk with Hybrid Theory by Linkin Park on full blast in my headphones because that's what you listen to when you're mad at your dad. After that I found I was no longer so fixated on the problem, and I could put him away until next session, and I could put the problem away until it was time to deal with it. If you are excited for the next thing that's going to happen, take some time to reflect on what has led up to it. If your character is in love, write a love letter, make a playlist, write fic, get those feelings out and let them go. You want to be able to feel them when it's appropriate, when you're in the game. Carrying them all the time will just make them weird or sour or bad, and the last thing you want is to fixate so hard on these feelings that the resolution in the actual game can't live up to it. Number six, activities. That was really heavy. Uh, activities. I get distracted during role-playing games. Again, very neurodivergent. Cannot deal with cameras, which probably sounds weird coming from a YouTuber, but yeah, tabletop with cameras on is a nightmare for me because I can see myself the whole time and I'm not in costume and on like I am for a LARP, so the image doesn't match the character and it's just, wait, is this a dysphoria, I think. <laughs> I don't like looking at Roll20 all the time, especially since a lot of my games are very roleplay heavy. I don't like having Discord permanently open because I start reading stuff in the text channels and then I'm missing what's actually going on. And a lot of things, like mobile games, are just too distracting for the game itself and I don't really like to browse the internet because that always ends up with me on eBay buying more LARP kit and activities that you can do with your hands to keep them busy without distracting you from the game. Because I do a lot of crafts, I have a lot of craft jobs that are, not to put too fine a point on it, deeply boring. 
massive granny square crochet blankets, endless stocking stitch in the round, hand sewing a hem, flat felling seams, paper piecing, weaving, making eyelets, cutting out paper patterns, any craft that you put off doing because it's kind of boring and repetitive, ideal for during the game. It keeps you focused on the role playing game because you're bored of the craft, but also you're doing the craft so you can't get distracted by anything else. I am so productive it's unreal, I get so much hand sewing done when I can dedicate a minimum of four hours a week to it. Number seven, getting an enjoyable role playing experience. I consider myself pretty lucky in that I have, in general, had really good role playing experiences. I also know that's not entirely down to luck. I put in the work to get a good role playing experience and you can too. My one weird trick that makes GMs hate me, not really, GMs love this, so do most co-players, my one freakish hack that almost always works out positively for me is the simplest thing in the world and I don't actually know why people don't do it more often. Tell people what you want. It's that easy, tell people what you want. On the one hand I think we can get so caught up in how clever it is if you can somehow manipulate events into happening the way you want them to without showing your hand, or the puppet strings, or being a good role player by being responsive to emergent play and letting things evolve naturally without influencing their direction, or even not causing problems and not wanting to railroad or take control and being good and cooperating with the rest of the group, or thinking that the correct and polite way to go about things is to try and subtly hint at what you want until someone offers it to you. That we can really easily find ourselves in the position where we don't know what we want but we're not getting it. That's a bad way to role play and a bad way to live your life in general. You are allowed to want things and if you do you should communicate that. And to be clear on two points, telling people what you want doesn't mean you're going to get it. Failure is an important part of role playing games. And I don't mean plan things out of character. You can do that. There is absolutely no shame on out of character conversations whether they are as simple as hey I'm interested in a romantic arc in this game, is that something you're interested in, how would we do it? Or as complex as are you open to pre-planning this confrontation, I find this really stressful and I want to be sure we get to a resolution we're both comfortable with and I don't out of character hurt your feelings because I'm really worried about that. But also your character is allowed to tell other characters what they want, what their goals and ambitions are, what they think is a good course of action, what kinds of role play they're interested in. At my first big weekend game I didn't know what I was doing or who this character was, so I talked to a lot of people and some of them told me their plans and what they wanted to achieve or suggested ways this relationship could go and I got to decide if I wanted to help them or oppose them, which generated a whole heap more role play for both of us. There are people who didn't really give me anything at that first event and I didn't really give them anything back because I didn't have a good sense of what I was doing and over time we just didn't interact that much. And at my second event as that character I figured out what I wanted to do, what my big goal was, and I was trying to figure out a clever way of doing it for if I could like trick people into it and then I was like no, this is actually going to take too long and it's already Saturday afternoon, someone will beat me to it, this isn't a sneaky character and this is silly. So I walked straight up to my faction head and like four other random people who were there and said hey here's some background information, off the back of that I think this is the course of action we should take, more specifically I myself would like to take these exact steps personally for no reason other than I just want to, can I have your blessing and also that very shiny new MacGuffin you just got handed? And my faction head looked at the other people and was like anybody have any problems with that? And everyone was like nah sounds like you have a plan. So they gave me the thingy and I got to do the thing and in the massive sandboxy make your own fun lark game I chased down the one piece of ref dropped plot relentlessly for the entire rest of the game and I mostly had a great time doing it. Because the secret is many people don't have a plan much of the time. A lot of role players are going with the flow so when you step up and say hey I want this you give them a direction. Whether that's sorry I can't give you that but I'm now aware you want it so I can link you up with those opportunities if they arise or yeah you know what I'm in. Let's try and get us that now we have a goal and a purpose. Or you know what I want that too. Or I think that's abhorrent and awful. Do you want to fight for it? You don't have to be super explicit either especially not in tabletop which is generally a longer form role play experience than say a LARP. In the longest running tabletop campaign I'm currently a part of, you will get sick of hearing about this, everyone else in my life is, one of the things I came in with in my character backstory was a whirlwind romance that had ended in an unsatisfying kind of open ended way. Always put a loaded gun in your backstory, but that's another video. At the time it was a good illustration of the direction I felt this character was going. The themes I wanted to hit, deep down he's a hopeless romantic but the world is not kind, there's a lot of reasons he can't pursue the kind of relationships he really wants, he routinely puts his own wants and needs to the bottom of the priority list, but I didn't know how this game was going to play, I wanted to take my time feeling out this character and what kind of role play I was going to enjoy with this group and this setting. Turns out romantic role play was really compatible with the game and the characters we were playing and so I could lean into that part of the backstory. I could bring it up, I could tell people about it, I could tell people my feelings about it. Not only have I brought it up a bunch but I've had multiple usually teary eyed conversations with the group, specific other characters, important NPCs, he even dated another player character for a whole two weeks in game, it was as rocky and chaotic as you could probably 
probably imagine, and the fallout of that breakup is still deliciously rolling on. As this character slowly came to the realisation he was not over this past relationship at all, still very much in love with this guy, absolutely no idea if you'd ever see him again, cool, excellent, emergent play. No! Every one of those conversations, every development, every revelation was a choice on my part to bring this to the table, explore it more, to bring this backstory point up, to make it a subject of conversation and a clear invitation to other players. This was an area of roleplay I was excited about and interested in, and oh boy, late night conversations with another player character about the current NPC you both have a really complicated crush on and the inherent tensions between the kind of relationship you really want and what you feel you're allowed to have. My fellow players not only understood what I was putting down, they went, heck yeah, we mostly aren't going to date you, but we can give you that sweet romance adjacent roleplay, that's our jam, let's talk about big feelings. This goes the other way too. If you don't want something, just say so. If there's an area of roleplay another player wants to get into and you're not feeling it, you can choose to disengage. Remember that challenging whatever thing in character is engagement. If someone else says, I want to go to the Dread Dungeon, and you in character say, absolutely not, I will not let you go to the Dread Dungeons, you are in some way leaning into the Dread Dungeons being a topic of roleplay. You are now going to have a debate in character. If you're uncomfortable with something, the quickest and easiest way to deal with it is to drop out of character and say, oh see, I really don't want to do that, or I'm uncomfortable with that, please can we talk about something else? If you're just not interested, suggest something else that you are interested in, or just don't engage. If a character makes a flirty remark and everyone else in the rest of the party is like, so how about that political intrigue, that's a pretty clear indication that nobody here is currently interested in romantic roleplay with you. If you make a flirty remark and some other player is like, how dare you, we've only just met, congrats, you now have an in-character rivalry slash will they won't they romance. This is also the best way of avoiding people you don't like roleplaying with at LARPs but who keep seeking you out, I think we've all had that happen. Just be extremely boring and don't engage. What are your feelings on this important topic? Well, you know. But do you agree or disagree? You should probably talk to my faction head. Are you free for drinks later? Actually, no, I don't think I am. Any, any reason for that? Eh. I hope you've enjoyed this video. It got a bit more pop psychology than I'm used to, but hey, years of therapy and hard-hitting emotional roleplay will do that to you. If you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, I'd love it if you subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to like and comment to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram if you'd like to see pictures of my cat. And down in the description box, you'll find a link to my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off or reoccurring donation to support this channel and my life's quest to taste every flavor of Fanta. Ko-fi supporters get early access to all of my videos, permanent links to unlisted content like live streams, and the odd sneak peek into what's to Come. I couldn't do what I do without them, and they maybe know what my next big project is already. Thank you so much for watching, dream big, and I'll see you next time. But what he also has a lot is... Bugger. You are a problem, you know that? See, everyone else is behaving themselves.